Today we are going to present one work of our laboratory, okay, that has been recently published in the Journal of Extracellular Biology. And the work that will be presented by uh, the one of the uh, PhD students of the laboratory, who is uh, Maria Azparren Angulo. So she is uh, in uh, her third year of, of, uh, of PhD. And uh, she already had been working with this extracellular vesicle related with uh, obesity um, so for some time ago. Hello everyone, I am Maria and I will present the article titled Extracellular Vesicles Related by Osteatotic Hepatocytes uh, and their Adipo Adiposite Metabolism. As you can see in the title, we combine the extracellular vesicles with metaboli metabolomics. Um, our group is formed by the Exosomes Laboratory and the Metabolomics Platform of CAC Biogune. Through the, through the study of the extracellular vesicles, we try to develop low invasive diagnosis method or therapeutic tools. And for that purpose, we can use a high throughput technique. Uh, before presenting the article, I am going to explain the work dynamics that we have in the laboratory and uh, how we have ended up working with extracellular vesicles for better understanding of the context of the, of the article. So as you all know, extracellular vesicles are circulating membrane-bound entities characterized by a specific carbon such as proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and metabolites. Uh, they can be classified uh, in three main groups depending on the size and formation mechanisms. And due to the heterogeneity that it has been seen inside each group in the last uh, in the last year has been proposed a simple classification between large extracellular vesicles and small extracellular vesicles. Um, the large extracellular vesicles are the ones that are bigger than 200 to nanometers in diameter, and the small extracellular vesicles are the ones that are smaller than to, uh, 200 to nanometers in diameter. And in this presentation, I will focus on small extracellular vesicles and um, the group that will include the exosomes. Okay, so to start working with the extracellular vesicles, um, we first use uh, the resources that we had in the lab and we characterize the proteome of uh, hepatocytes derived extracellular vesicles. So for this experiment, we use rat primary hepatocytes and the extracellular vesicles um, derived from mouse liver progenitor 29 cell line. And in this first analysis, uh, we found uh, 550 proteins um, inside the vesicles and many of them were enzymes and that enzymes were active. So after these results, we thought, okay, if this is happening in uh, physiological conditions, maybe in an abnormal conditions, we can find active enzymes that will have an effect in our receptor organ or tissue. So our next step was to analyze the proteome of the extracellular vesicles from the primary hepatocytes that were previously treated with hepatotoxic drugs. In this second study, we found active enzymes too, and we see differences in the compositions of the extracellular vesicles between controls and treated uh, extracellular vesicles. So we could found some possible markers for the liver injury in, in that vesicles. So after these findings, we try to see the effect that these extracellular vesicles will have in target tissues of organs. And as you know, the hepatocytes are in contact with the blood and, and with the bill. And because of that, uh, we decide to start with the blood metabolome as a target or, or a tissue. Um, in this experiment, uh, we petrate the uh, the primary hepatocytes in culture with different hepatotoxic drugs such as acetaminophen or diclofenac. And after the incubation and the isolation of these extracellular vesicles, we incubate the extracellular vesicles with the blood. And through mass spectrometry, uh, we analyze the blood uh, metabolism. Um, we first did a target analysis and, and we study 519 metabolites 
and we found that 67 uh, of that metabolites were affected. Inside, inside these metabolites, we found active enzymes in every condition, but these enzymes changing uh, depending on the um, treatment. So comparing the control with different treatments, we can detect different compounds in the, in the blood metabolism. Um, knowing this result, our next question was, what are the impact of these changes uh, in the progression of the disease? Uh, for that, uh, we did an target analysis of the blood metabolome to try to identify, uh, to identify a possible target uh, compounds. And we found 94 metabolic signals that were alterated. Among them appeared the arginine, and the arginine is one, and the arginine plays a role in the vascular function. So we try to see the effect that these structural vesicles could have in, in the vascular function of the body. And as a target organ of the vascular function, uh, we use the pulmonary, pulmonary artery. So our next step was to incubate the um, extracellular vesicles from the patocytes uh, with rat pulmonary artery to see if there was a change, a changes that could affect the vascular function. And as you can see here in the graphic, uh, in the graphs, in the present of the ibis uh, treated with with acetaminophen, um, the, um, the, the function of the pulmonary artery um, related to relaxation uh, change. So um, this, this artery is affected in, in the relaxation function. The project that I explained now was an example of how extracellular vesicles study could help to understand better uh, the progression of of the diseases. And our lab started working in, in the drug induced liver injury, but nowadays we don't work with a specific disease. We try to understand the role of the extracellular vesicles in different diseases and the impact of those in different target of ones. So now I will start with the, with the article. So in, in this article, um, we focus on the metabolic syndrome that is a disease that manifests in many tissues. So what is a metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is a group of, of conditions associated with an increased risk of getting coronary heart disease, um, a stroke, and other alteration uh, of the blood vessels. Um, for someone to be diagnosed with the metabolic syndrome, three of the following conditions must be present the central obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, or insulin resistance. Um, this disease affects 25% uh, of adults worldwide, and in the last year, it has been seen that extracellular vesicles have been implicated in the progression of, of the metabolic syndrome. Um, to study this disease, uh, we work with an in vivo model of Thacker rat. So Thacker rats are generated spontaneously by a fatty mutation. This model has the leptin receptor mutated, so uh, they never uh, feel a satiety effect. Uh, the Thacker rat is considered a pre-diabetic model, and um, we can have uh, two phenotypes, the lean one and the obese one. Uh, for the cellular vesicles isolation, first we perform an hepatic perfusion of the of the Thacker rat. We see our primary hepatocytes in, in culture with exofree media for 36 hours. And finally, we, we isolate our cellular vesicles through differential ultracentrifugation, uh, keeping the fraction of the small extracellular vesicles. Uh, so once we have the extracellular vesicles, we did a characterization of the vesicles and the cells. Uh, through monofluorescence, we confirm that our fatty hepatocytes maintain their uh, fatty phenotype. So we stain with a um, body P dye, that is a lipophilic dye, our primary hepatocytes to stain the intracellular fat droplets. Um, then, through electron microscopy, we analyze the extracellular vesicles purity. 
And after that, uh, we analyzed the average uh, protein content in extracellular vesicles. And we can detect an increase in, in protein content in, in the extracellular vesicles from obese hepatocytes when we compare with the limb. And this uh, was confirmed but, um, by the um, nanocyte um, analysis where an increase in particle number in the case of uh, obese preparations, uh, we can see in the, in the analysis. Um, after that, we analyzed the particle size distribution. And despite that, then 90% of the particles in our extracellular vesicles preparations were below 300 nanometers in diameter. Uh, there was a significant decrease in a 150, 200 uh, nanometer size range and an increase in uh, late uh, stacellar vesicles obtained from um, the obese hepatocytes. So showing the differences that uh, observed in the protein content in the size distribution, um, we say, okay, maybe, there might be changes in the protein carbon. So we, analyze, we start analyzing some of them uh, through Western blood and we can start seeing differences in the protein composition of lean uh, and obese um, cells and extracellular vesicles. So in this Western blood, um, we, um, we see that, for example, in the case of um, extracellular vesicle markers, there are differences uh, between obese and lean. In the CD63, we can see that um, there is a clear reduction in the case of uh, obese samples in the cells, and the same happens in the extracellular vesicles. Uh, this question let us know the purity of our extracellular vesicles too. For example, um, the PRP uh, is a cell damage marker, and we can see that there is not contamination of apoto apoptotic cells, or in the case of COX-4 and GRP78, um, we can see that there is not cellular contamination needed. Um, because of that, our next step was to analyze the whole proteome of these extracellular vesicles derived from, from hepatocytes. So, uh, in this analysis, we detect 450 proteins and um, 148 were differentially, differentially expressed. We were able to detect many different pathways that were alterated in the protein cargo of the extracellular vesicles, such as glycolysis, uh, pentosulfate, citrate cycle, and lipid metabolism. And in, in the figure, we can see all the pathways that were alterated in the metabolism. And in this slide, uh, I wanted to show you in more detail the proteins that uh, we found alterated in each pathway. There are not two proteins per pathway. There are more changes inside each one. The, one that have, um, the ones that you see in green are the ones that are regulated in obese extracellular vesicles compared to lean, and the ones that appear in red are the ones that are upregulated. Uh, knowing that fatty extracellular vesicles have an increase in protein abundance, has differences in protein cargo and in size distribution of the particle, we suggest the possibility that these extracellular vesicles could have a potentially distinct physiological effect in recipient cells. Because of that, our next uh, step was to study the effect of these extracellular vesicles in a receptor cell. So it was previously reported that adipocytes are involved in, in metabolic syndrome development as, as the hepatocytes, and because of that, we try to see if, if there is a connection between these two affirmations and if there is a vesicle dependent regulation. So for this purpose, uh, we study the impact of the hepatocytes derivate extracellular vesicles on fully differentiated adipocyte metabolism. Um, to start with this study, we first did an uptake assay uh, to see if our extracellular vesicles um, were internalized in these adipocytes. 
for that, uh, we incubate the cells with um, label uh, with label um, extracellular vesicles, and uh, from lean and obese um, model. And in the case of the control, we added um, the media containing DIL uh, after ultra centrifugation, but without IBIS, without the extracellular vesicles. And as we can see in the confocal figure, uh, adipocytes internalize both the extracellular vesicles, the lean ones and the obese ones. So um, after the incubation, we perform an untarget metabolomic analysis of the fully differentiated adipocytes with an N of eight per group. And in, in this case, um, we did uh, two, two, we performed uh, two different treatments. Um, the short treatment and the long treatment. So in the short treatment, we incubate the cells with the extracellular vesicles for 24 hours. And in the long treatment, we incubate them for 24 hours, but three times. So in, in the untarget uh, metabolomic analysis, we found 1,029 metabolic peaks detected. And in the, in the multivariate analysis, we could, we could see a clear um, discrimination in both treatments, in the short treatment and in the long treatment. In the analysis, we found many metabolic peaks uh, that were significantly affected in short and long treatment and in obese and lean extracellular vesicles. Uh, from all of them, we were able to identify 12 of them, the ones that appear here in the graphs. And as it can be seen, we can find alterated metabolites in both cases, but the major effect appears in extracellular vesicles from obese animals that once had more pronounced effect. Even so, if we analyze every graph in more detail, we can see that there is no a general effect. The effect is depending on its metabolite, for example. In the case of glutamine and arginine, if we see um, the, um, the lean animals, we can see uh, an effect in the, short, uh, in the short treatment, but this effect um, is loose in the long treatment. But in the case of vitamin 5, um, the, um, the effect is more pronounced in the long treatment. And, um, uh, for the other hand, in, in, the, in the case of obese animals, um, we see that it's losing a little bit the, the effect of the treatment in the long, um, in the long uh, treatment when we see glutamine and arginine, and this is not happening in the vitamin uh, B5. So as a general conclusion, uh, we, can, we can say for the metabolic syndrome that the Fatty pactocytes derivate extracellular vesicles are carrying different protein signature, and that the pactocytes derivate extracellular vesicles have a pleiotrophic effect on the adipocytes, and that those effects um, vary between extracellular vesicles of healthy and damaged pactocytes, and that our long and short treatments show that extracellular vesicles could generate different type of effects on cells. As a general conclusion, we can say that the metabolomics is a good method for characterization of extracellular vesicles and to study the effect that these extracellular vesicles could have in other cells or tissues. So finally, I want to thank all my group and all our collaborators for all the support and the help and all of you for your attention and for the opportunity to present our group, uh, our work. All right. Well, Maria, thank you so much for presenting and uh, congratulations too on this, uh, on this publication as well. One of those has to do with the, um, with the stability of the metabolites. So, so how, um, you know, how, how, what is the range of stability of, of the metabolites and how important is it to work with fresh samples versus archived samples um, when you are doing metabolomics? 
tricky question. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a, it's like an impossible <laughs> question, right? It's a because <laughs> everything has its own half life. But uh, but anyway, just to, if you have some some general thoughts on that to to guide us. Mm, we try to work with with mm, more fresh um, preparations that we we can, but it's true that we need it, it's not possible to do all the process um, in the same day. So we try to only uh, freeze once our samples to try to don't uh, alter the a lot the metabolites. But yeah. um, we don't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Juanma. In, yes, but I, I don't remember that if we uh, look at differences uh, using fresh sample or samples that are uh, freezer one times uh, one time and if this um, change a lot um, the metabolite. Mm -hmm. I think that no only with with one freezer but I don't I don't really know. If I can complement that so the the, th the issue is if we want to to see to, to look the activity of the vesicles frozen one time we didn't see too much difference okay because all my all the data that maria and she did was with at least one frozen samples and showing for example with the with the with the metabolome of the blood that were incubated with the vesicles that that vesicle were already frozen one time so at least one time give we don't have the the analysis of how much you lose all the time okay this is from the point of view of the enzymes then from the point of view of the stability of the of the metabolites we i mean each metabolite is uh, different this is what i can tell you and for example other meta metabolites from the methionine cycle that we have a lot of expertise in the in our platform one of them is very tricky to do it very soon and and even during the frozen, uh, even during the storage at minus 80 degree, they degrade. So even that affect the metabolites. So, but this is specific of each metabolite. So you need to do the, 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 if you are interested in one of them, you need to analyze that one specifically. So this, this is what I can tell you, but it's something important to have in mind with metabolomics activity and also the stability of the compound itself in that. Yeah, I, I, I've I've always found that to be to be a very interesting aspect of metabolomics because we have you know we have various biomarkers that are more or less stable. Some of them are extremely stable. You know, DNA can be very stable. A lot of proteins mm -hmm. are quite stable. Um, so I'm wondering too, um, could what do both of you think about uh, you know when when assays are developed, clinical assays? Um, Will it be, is it, is it that we just need to focus on those metabolites that are more stable and that can be collected uh, using standard blood collection protocols? Or is it perhaps necessary or might it become necessary for us to come up with new collection protocols or new stabilization protocols um, for de novo collection? Uh, it's important to work with, with um, the metabolites that are more stable because uh, if we want to um, to go to a clinic, and the the samples that we are gonna obtain from from the patient, we need to store. So if if we found some biomarkers that uh, are not stable, then we are gonna lose them in the process to obtain the samples from, from the patients to arrive to us. And in our cases, we always treat the same, um, the OBs or the lean and our controls. So, I mean, we store at, at the same time, we work with them all the time the same way. So if we see changes in the controls, we, we are gonna see the same changes in, in our and disease and samples. Indeed, so very, just very important to make sure that all the samples are handled in the same way um, for the reproducibility. Very good, thank, thank you, Maria, for the comments. So we, um, we now have a few um, questions that are coming in in the chat box. 
And I'm just going to ask people to unmute themselves. So when I call you, just feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask your questions. So we first have a couple of questions from Amrita Chima from Georgetown University. Amrita, go ahead. Thanks, Ken. So uh, great presentation, Maria. Thank you. A couple of questions. So when you said you did the 24 hours versus 72 hours, um, did you dose your cells with EVs periodically or it was just one acute exposure and then you just followed the cells over 72 hours? Yeah, sorry, could you repeat? So you said you did acute treatment and long-term treatment, right? The mm -hmm. acute treatment was 24 hours. And then you also incubated the cells up to 72 hours and followed them up, right? So the question was, did you dose them repeatedly with EVs or was it just one-time EV treatment? In the long treatment? Yeah. No, in the long treatment, uh, we repeat, uh, we change uh, the vesicles every 24 hours. You, you, okay, yes. all right, that was my question. And then also, you know, it's interesting that you saw that depletion of vitamin B5, which was consistent, whether you, in the acute term or long term, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, biology of the metabolic syndrome that you ultimately want to study? And are you planning to follow up those findings? Yeah, we are planning to follow, but it's quite tricky because we see a lot of changes and it's, it's difficult to understand the biology questions. And we are working on that, but it's quite tricky. So yeah, I, in that moment, I don't have an answer for, for, okay. for that. We are working on, on that, but no. No problems. And, and thank you so much. And fi one final question before I yes. turn it back to Ken. How many cells did you use for metabolomics? Uh, we normally uh, use, I think, that three million. Three million. Okay. And from three million, uh, we did uh, two injections. So are like um, double. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much, Maria. Back to you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. For Thanks for the questions. All right. And we now have a question from Azam. Azam, please go ahead with your question. Hi, everyone. Thanks there for we your go. Hi. I want to now. Uh, I want to know how you isolate your exosome. Uh, do you use ultra centrifuge or you uh, concentrate your media? Yeah, I use uh, ultra centrifugation, and in the final step, I did a uh, cleaning with PBS. But yeah, it's um, ultra centrifugation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can show the presentation. I think that no, but they have an, uh, the protocol in my presentation. And the, I think the second part to that question was how, so you used primary hepatocytes. So how much, how much culture medium did you, did you uh, start how with? How much? How much? Sorry. Vol volume of uh, culture medium. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, 13 milliliters per plate. So how much do we know about how different EV separation methods affect the outcome of, of metabolomics? So far for metabolomics, in, in my expertise, I always did uh, ultra centrifugation. So I didn't compare or we didn't compare. And I don't know other people uh, the data, but I suppose that there will be, I mean, when you do other proteomics or protein characterization, different methods give you different, different population. Let's say. I suppose that for metabolomic would be more or less the same, but I didn't have the we don't have data at least in, from the comparison metabolomics to, to do metabolomics so far we have done from uh, from ultra centrifugation because you need material you need a lot of material because you, you cannot amplify signals so it's, it's something that uh, still is a limitation of the of the metabolomics and data and yeah for for example the analysis of the metabolome of vesicles normally we we do with uh, th before maria has sent 30 milliliter of i mean 50 milliliter per plate but we play with uh, i don't know maybe 20 plates so it's like a 300 milliliter on media would we obtain the extracellular vesicle to do the metabolism of this extracellular vesicle to to have uh, a signal of many signal many metabolic signals to characterize because of course, you, if you go down 
most of the signal will be lipids and sometimes you see many lipids on that but we in our laboratory we, we, we try also to focus in non-lipid material so polar metabolites can, can i chime in for yeah go, go for it yeah. so we recently published a paper where we actually com uh, compared uh, size exclusion chromatography based mm -hmm. isolation with ultra centrifugation and we got a very good overlap, you know, I, I want to say north of 80, 85%, which was pretty good. Uh, we've also done bead-based methods. And the main difference we find is, you know, the protein uh, characterization uh, remains pretty consistent, but what is um, strikingly different is that both UC preparation, meaning the ultra centrifugation, as well as the SCC preparation, uh, yield biologically active EVs. So if you were looking to do some functional assays with these EVs, both of these methods yield perfectly fine, you know, EVs. Whereas if you use bead-based methods, um, they are very efficient in terms of yields, but for some reason the EVs are completely inactive. So that, that's really the basic difference we found. Not so much between the EV cargo okay. characterization, but really between their functional functionality. So. And what was what was your readout for the functionality? Um, we were trying to do everything from, you know, uh, looking at the proliferation, migration. So the capability of uh, cancer-derived EVs to induce proliferation and, you know, migration in normal pancreatic epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in well, fact, you, you see cellular toxicity if you have these bead-based EVs and if you add them to the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you looked at the internalization of those EVs from different preparations regarding yes. the cell, receiving cells? Uh-huh. What's the difference? They internalize fine, but the bead-based are just going to cause cell death. All right. Um, and and I, I think so. I, I think somebody said the word stability to me yesterday, and so I've just got stability in my head. Are there... Um, Maria, Juan, are there some metabolites that you think are more stable inside the EV than outside it? Not all, but I think that in the end, when it's inside the vesicle, it's it will be like in, inside the, the, the cell. So um, the, the media that the metabolite is in, in, in which metabolites the metabolite it is um, is not changing. So if it's not um, super stable, I think that it will be better go inside the vesicles than be um, outside. I, I think the, the the vesicle will provide some protection to the to the to the metabolites, but also because thinking in how is inside the vesicle. Is going to be in, in one structure. So it's not uh, um, so. It's, it's, we think uh, um, as PBS inside the vesicle, but the, the vesicle itself will have some osmolarity. So yes, I, th I also think that this will protect the metabolite. But so far, it's something to to know. It's not not very well known. So yeah, but it's something to have in mind. Good. All right. Well, it's good to identify some of those. Outstanding questions too. Um, our uh, speaking of questions, our next question here is from Phil Askenes. Phil, go ahead. You have a question about immunometabolism. This is a very important area, um, clinically certainly, and uh, you have a very big group. And meta met metabolics is a is a huge subject, but um, um, for my interest, monocyte macrophages are an important aspect of the metabolism and of the immune part of the metabolic syndrome. Um, and there already is data to indicate that the adipose cells talk to the monocyte macrophages. And so that could be under the direction of the hepatic EVs. Um, um, so there, there, there is a whole monocyte macrophage aspect, both metabolism wise and immune system wise that you likely are, are touching into. Uh, and I hope you'll be able to get to at some point. Now we start only with the um, hepatocytes and adipocytes, but yeah, for sure, mac uh, macrophages are an immune system. It's there, but we are thinking to, to make more um, 
physiological uh, models, but right now we uh, focus more in the metabolic part uh, of uh, adipocytes and, and hepatocytes. But yeah, we are thinking um, to move to the immune system and immune response too. Yeah, I, I recommend staying physiologic. So in the adipose tissue you're working with, there are uh, adipose macrophages mm -hmm. that are workable. Uh, and to stay physiologic rather than using some tired old macrophage yeah. cell mm -hmm. line. Yes, the idea is to, to, to join together also, not just one by one also, to have together because at the end in the tissue will be together, all working together. Oh, yes, so, yeah, the, the, this is the, the point. Yeah. Well, the exchange of the vesicles yeah. Yeah, from yeah, sure. the hepatic to the adipose to the macrophages, uh, and then, of course, the, the microRNAs uh, in the vesicles uh, um, are probably very important in a lot of that communication. Yeah, and also the, the, the vesicles secreted by the hepatocyte that are taken by the macrophage, and these macrophage modify and secrete and then go yes, to adipose. Yes. So all yes. this biology behind it will be very relevant. And, yeah. it, it's probably likely that the, the macrophages take up more of these vesicles than the adipose cells do by their very nature, I, I would guess. Yeah, thanks very much, Phil, for the, for the comments and suggestions. So um, I believe that brings us to the end of the questions that we have in the chat box. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, uh, Maria, for an excellent presentation um, and for, uh, no, you for driving this work forward. Um, and okay. Juanma, thank you so much for, uh, for joining too. I, I just want to ask though, I know we didn't, we didn't rehearse this at all and I had a, a pressing engagement maybe a little bit late. So um, I was just wondering, Juan, could you, um, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about the journal here? Because this is one of the first papers that appeared in the Journal of Extracellular Biology. And I know that you are um, one of three deputy editors with the journal. Um, so this is the new journal for, um, for, for ISEV. And could you perhaps just say a few words about um, the focus of the journal and, um, and what people can think about if they want to submit to the journal? So yes, the journal you say is, is, is from this year started, and uh, we uh, published this uh, data. And the idea of the of the scope of the journal, that is uh, the, the editor in chief is Andy Hill, uh, we is broader than the journal extracellular vesicle. So the idea is thinking in that the vesicle goes no is not alone secreted. So it's secreted also with other particles that could be uh, accompanying or, and could be also necessary for the functioning of these vesicles because maybe alone are not doing the same uh, effect than when they are together with the, with the, with the other companions. So the idea of, the, of the, the scope is that is to bring more to extracellular particles secreted by cells, okay? And this could Cool is broader, as you can understand, from, from the view of the vesicle alone. And, and how it's also true that the, the focus is a good characterization of these extracellular particles, okay, and then having some effects. So this is more the, the what we expect to, to have in the in the public in this journal. Okay. And this is my, my, my encourage, I encourage a lot if you have good data regarding the extracellular particles, maybe are not along only vesicles, it's broader, but it's a, a good, I think will be a good journal to, to publish in. So far, I think there are already 20, 20 something already publication accepted. So it's, getting and we receive a good number uh, of publication already uh, is the what i can tell you i don't know any question specifically i will answer thanks juan for introducing the journal okay. really really exciting times i think and thank you for your service too um to the to the journal and to the community it's a pleasure. Uh, so thanks uh, thanks everybody for joining today uh -huh. and hope to uh to see you at an event coming up soon take care now thank you thank you again thank you everyone